My name's Nick. I love music, I love horror movies, and I hate the government. This YouTube channel might get taken down, so make sure you follow me on Odyssey and Telegram. You can get early access to all of my videos on Subscribestar, or send me a one-off donation at Buy Me A Coffee, and check out my archive of work over the years at jacked.uk. This is the first time we've played live together as a band since February. And like, this is going to sound a bit lame, but I've got tears in my eyes because this is what we live for. And it's just so amazing to be able to create this noise with my best friends again. So thanks very much to Kerrang for having us here because this is just, oh, so good. <laughs> Waited so long. This next song's about saying a big fuck you to people who are disrespectful to women in music. Svalbard's fourth album, The Weight of the Mask, was released on Nuclear Blast Records in October last year to critical acclaim, being called a masterpiece by Kerrang! and awarded a perfect five score. Svalbard is very hard to categorise. Like mm -hmm. if someone said to you, what genre is Svalbard? I would not know which genre to pick. For my guitar leads, I'm really inspired by video game soundtracks uh, like Final Fantasy, Kingdom Hearts, World of Warcraft. Oh, That's wow. kind of what I'm trying to recreate is that same feeling that those soundtracks have when I write my guitar leads and then the other guys are into like grindcore, tech death, um, post metal, shoegaze, post rock. I think we all have an appreciation of post rock bands like Mono and Explosions in the Sky. Svalbard are a band that don't fit neat categorization with equal parts black metal, crust punk, post rock and shoegaze all coalescing into a cacophony that can only really be described as very heavy rock music with extremely upfront lyrics. I am very much all about an album of contrasts and that's to musically represent the feeling of kind of walking on a tightrope when you're struggling with mental illness. Once we had all of the songs finished that's when I tend to how I work with it is I'll listen to the song and I'll think of what feelings and experiences match the atmosphere of the music and try and kind of marry the two together then I'll go back through everything I've been writing over the last couple of years lyrically and just sort of piece it together. So the whole, entire album has a central kind of lyrical thread running through it of depression, how this affects your relationship with yourself, how this affects your relationship with others, masking, where that pressure to mask comes from. Does it come internally? Does it come from external societal pressures? And so the idea, the weight, that is referring to the pressure. The Weight of the Mask is an extraordinary portrayal of severe mental health issues, crippling anxiety, deep depression and unrequited love, splicing familiar sounds from every corner of extreme punk and metal. This is a video about why I think Svalbard are the best underground band in Britain today. Formed in 2011 by guitarist Serena Cherry and Liam Fellon and drummer Mark Lilly, Svalbard are named after an archipelago midway between the coast of Norway and the North Pole. I was on tour supporting a prog band and the guy driving the van for the prog band on the first date of the tour jumped out wearing a dying fetus shirt and so I was like, oh, I've got to talk to him about dying fetus, obviously. <laughs> So we started chatting and that's Liam, uh, the other guitar player and vocalist in Svalbard. And he watched my set and afterwards he said, I'd love to do something like what you're doing, but metal and like heavy. Previous before that, I played in a black metal band and I played in a prog metal band. So was super excited about the prospect of that. So Liam and I started jamming, uh, just writing riffs together. Um, and yeah, sort of coming up with the bare bones of, of the Svalbard sound. And then we were in a rehearsal studio and we overheard Mark, the drummer, playing with a different band. <laughs> and we were like, oh, he's good. 
basically we, we poached him. Um, sorry, other band. The band's debut album, One Day All This Will End, was released in 2015 with lyrics covering depression, sexism and social media. And I think it's this stark lyrical content, completely rid of cloudy metaphors and veiled similes, that gets Svalbard labelled post-hardcore when they look and sound much more like a metal band. Despite sounding like a mashup of Mayhem, Discharge and Mogwai, Svalbard is very clearly a vehicle for blowing off steam and extreme emotional expression in the same lineage as Hoos could do at the drive-in or Converge. In 2016, Vice's music blog Noisy hosted the music video for Expect Equal Respect, posted with it a short essay from Serena, blasting the recent interests Svalbard were receiving from journalists and promoters simply for being female-fronted, railing against the expectation that no woman would ever think to pick up a guitar herself unless we patronise them with best female artist shortlists, treated as something to look at rather than something to listen to, pointing out the inherent sexism that lies within positive discrimination. Svalbard had become a political ban simply because Serena was a woman who didn't appreciate being pandered to, and they leaned into the feminist social commentary on the next album, with an autobiographical account of Serena's own experiences of being sexually assaulted by a group of men at Whack and Open Air when she was 18, another about internet trolls, and one about sharing unsolicited naked pictures of an ex-girlfriend. Unpaid Intern is a song about the exclusion of the working class from the creative industries, and for the sake of the breed is about the cruelty of breeding short-nosed dogs for fashion whilst mongrels lie abandoned in shelters. The bluntness of the messaging is that of a crust-punk band like Subhumans or Crass, but with much, much more musical richness. It's Hard To Have Hope was listed as one of 2018's best albums by Decibel, Kerrang and Vice, and the band toured the UK and Europe, announcing the release of their third album, When I Die Will I Get Better, on Holy Raw in July of 2020. Continuing with the feminist theme with songs titled What Was She Wearing, The Currency of Beauty, and lead single Clickbait. <laughs> weeks before the release of the album, Svalbard learned that their label manager had been accused of raping two women in a series of allegations posted to Instagram. A third woman also came forward, and Svalbard immediately cut ties with the label, and Serena shared the allegations to social media, stating, I am deeply disturbed by the allegations made against Alex Fitzpatrick of Holy Raw Records. This is everything we stand against in Svalbard. This was a very accurate statement. This was everything Svalbard had stood against for three albums straight, and they were now left adrift, having lost their label whilst preparing to release an album with the end of lockdown still nowhere in sight. For the kind of more hands-on work in the live sector, I mean, it was it was absolutely devastating for, for people who couldn't get out there and work anymore. And I think there's something, obviously, I completely understand it, and safety is paramount, but there's something really cutting about the thing you do being deemed non-essential. Yeah, you know, yeah. Music is non-essential and everything you do, your shows, everything can be cancelled 
When I Die Will I Get Better was eventually released on Church Road Records, donating a portion of each sale to Rape Crisis, being described as one of the best albums of the year by Decibel, Kerrang and Metal Hammer, with the band having to wait a full year before they could embark on a tour. The album leaned much further into a shoegaze influence, with cleaner singing, more vocal harmonies and longer instrumental passages. Supremely heavy and extremely beautiful, Svalbard were tapping into a whole cross-section of sounds and scenes all at once, with long-term producer Lewis Johns growing with the band and helping them to expand their epic sound. Mark Lilly is a phenomenal drummer, constantly propelling the song forward with snare rolls, tom fills, breakdowns, brimming with animalistic energy. Serena's lead acts as a constantly stunning counterpart to her pained screams, but what truly stands Svalbard head and shoulders above their more instrumentally focused contemporaries is the harrowingly blunt lyrics. The words shock you when you hear them, but it's not the same shock as reading along with a Cannibal Corpse lyric sheet, because it's all so painfully real. Case in point, Open Wound, a five minute tale of lived domestic abuse. The video for Silent Restraint is built in the same style as Feeder's Just A Day and was compiled of clips filmed by fans throughout the lockdown, with Liam telling Kerrang that the video represented positivity and togetherness in a time when we've never been further apart. The juxtaposition between the lyrics to the song and the clips, a perfect metaphor for the situation we currently find ourselves in. They finally announced the nine date UK tour at the tail end of 2021, a full year after the album's release, having only played songs from the album to a socially distanced Kerrang! staff audience at the end of 2020. The following June, the band signed to the German heavy metal titan Nuclear Blast, responsible for releases from Meshuggah, Slayer and Nightwish, Serena's favourite band, and the label acquired the rights to the band's back catalogue ahead of the release of their fourth album, The Weight of the Mask, in October of last year. The Mask, I mean, there's so many different implications of this, even, yeah, just looking back on the last couple of years we've had with masks and how that relates to, to the pandemic and people, you know, the, the different reactions that people had to wearing a mask, but also in a far less literal sense, in the kind of way of a mask acting as a barrier that isolates you behind it and prevents other people from being able to connect with you because you are struggling so much with mental illness that you almost feel unable to connect with. It's a, yeah, there's a lot of different meanings to this album. Um, and that's kind of, I, I want the title to be sort of open to interpretation for, to anyone who listens. Every single one of us was isolated from our friends and family. Life drastically changed overnight. 
There was no opportunity to grieve, we all just had to get on with it. The entire world entered survival mode, living through unprecedented unemployment, stress, financial insecurity and health fears. Our elected officials don't address the emotional impact of what happened, so we must look to art. And whilst The Weight of the Mask isn't an album about the pandemic, it is an album about feeling socially distant. a triumphant release where no single song is found lacking and they couldn't have a more spectacular start than they do with faking it. It is a powerful and intense an anthem. It is mean as hell but it is also filled with a stunning amount of emotion. The chorus is bloody epic. The drumming has to be highlighted as being such an outstanding element. Back in 2013, Death Heaven's second album, Sunbather, became the most critically acclaimed album of the year on Metacritic, marrying the expansive cinematic sounds of post-rock and shoegaze to the cacophonous din of the least mainstream genre of all time, black metal. Ten years on, and Svalbard are taking those same influences, but adding a whole load more to the mix. Post-hardcore, post-metal, black metal, crust-punk, post-rock and shoegaze, musically Svalbard are flying the flag for an incredible array of sounds, all known for being extremely insular scenes. But it's not gimmicky, it's clearly born of a profound love of all the different micro-genres that have meant so much to so many outsiders. It's not the most um, comfortable landscape to be outspoken, I think, in a, in a band at the moment, and there's definitely uh, a temptation to play it safe, like lyrically, um, because yeah, it's it's already hard enough to to sort of exist as a band without alienating people or, or or getting a load of sort of unwanted attention in the comments. Revenge porn, obviously, about not trading nudes that girls give you trustingly. Uh, we have a song called Clickbait, which is about the way women are written about in the metal press. We have a song called Unpaid Intern, which is about how unfair unpaid internships are in the sense of they're not meritocratic at all and it basically means that people who can afford to do an unpaid internship who have a family home they can stay in and, and family money that they can use end up getting these positions and being able to work themselves into what is often more creative jobs meaning that you don't have the voice of the working class in cre the creative sphere anymore because they simply can't afford to be there. As well as being fiery representatives of so many subcultures, Svalbard also have a keen sense of justice, continually saying what needs to be said that nobody else is saying. And this is why the choice to focus all of that rage inward is, in my opinion, such a masterstroke, which makes for such a compelling listen. It doesn't matter whether you've been officially diagnosed with depression, the thoughts and feelings expressed in the lyrics speak of places and headspaces I've known all too well over the past few years, and I know I'm not alone in that. It's no wonder Serena fell headfirst into a deep depression, her and her bandmates pouring their heart and soul into their third album, only to find their label manager a serial abuser, with no opportunity to play the music for fans because of an unending lockdown. No amount of five-star reviews and internet praise can make up for the real-world experience of seeing your fans scream the words you wrote back at you. We have all suffered loss in one respect or another since the start of 2020. Mental illness, anxiety, depression and lost love are universal themes in the world today. I think lyrically the words, the words on the weight of the mask come from a sort of very desperate place. And I want the screams to really channel that frustration that you feel when you're fighting with yourself and when you're fighting against your own depression when you're feeling isolated but you also simultaneously can't reach out. It's really sort of strange to have songs about some of your worst experiences and to have like 
to create something out of so much pain the way i kind of describe it is like you've taken the sort of the seed of depression that's inside your head you've planted it into the the soil and um, and turned it into something in the process of making a song about it and then you watch that flower grow and that is you know it's transformative i have really struggled with depression recently and it has really impacted the lyrical theme on this album but i don't want that to be all i am i don't want to be painted as a broken person and do, do you know what i mean like for it to almost like eclipse every other side of me just because it's something i've written an album about This is one of those records where one week this will be a favourite track, the next week it'll be another one and so on and so on. Take November and Lights Out as the next examples. The former is dramatic and melody, a dramatic and melody driven listen that oozes heart wrenching atmosphere and increases in strength as it goes on. It's a nice curvature for this one. While the latter is an emphatic post hardcore delight of speed, heaviness and wistful melody. been around for a long time this is our fourth album so yeah we've just been slowly grinding away <laughs> uh, it's on smaller tours and working working our way up really I've made this video because I like making predictions and I like keeping receipts when I saw Frank Turner at the roundabout in High Wycombe on the 10th of March 2006 in front of a crowd of what must have been less than 20 people I predicted that he'd make it to arenas one day and I followed him on his ascent. He's now played Wembley Stadium, let alone the arena, and his last album went to number one. It's crazy to me that a band as proficient on every level as Svalbard headlined Club Eva Back on their last tour, a venue that I played in so often in my 20s that the bouncers stopped asking whether I was on the list and that I also went to see Frank Turner play back in 2007. This is not a big venue by any stretch of the imagination. It's insane to me that when I ordered a Svalbard t-shirt, it was Liam that posted it. It seems unreasonable that I should be able to go on Etsy and buy a homemade Sonic and Tails cross stitch made by Serena for £15. If you check the reviews of this album, it's universal praise across the board. So the fact that Svalbard don't even have a merch department is a damning indictment on how much live music has been attacked by government restrictions, social media addictions, wage stagnation, property prices and all manner of other factors that are keeping people from going out and taking a chance on a band that could just be the next big thing. Svalbard are touring with Enslaved throughout March playing in London, Leeds, Manchester, Glasgow and Dublin. Svalbard are one of the best bands in the world. The hype is real and it's albums like this that prove it unequivocally. Um, as I said at the start, I love this band. I really, really enjoy what they're doing. And like a lot of music, you know, you listen to it, you enjoy it, you listen to it for ages, then you kind of bury it as you move on to something else. Every time I come back to Svalbard, I'm like reintroduced to them again. I'm blown away again by what they're offering, what they're doing. And this album is that. It was like, a, oh, it's been a while since I've listened to some fresh Svalbard. I get a whole album worth here. And each bloody track is spectacular. 
they're already big. They've already blown up, but this is going to make them even bigger. Like, I cannot see a ceiling on this band. Everything that you hear on stage when Svalbard are performing is being performed by the four of us on stage. We have no backing track. We have no, we don't even use a click track. So it really is us in that moment live. And I have a huge concern with the amount of metal bands that rely very heavily on backing track. One really good example that I can use is we have Download Festival here in the UK and the headliners this year were Metallica and Bring Me the Horizon. And Metallica played the four of them as a four piece playing their hits and whatnot. And Bring Me the Horizon were very, had a lot of backing tracks going on. Mm -hmm. And I saw a lot of discourse on Twitter saying, Bring Me the Horizon were amazing and sounded amazing and Metallica was shit and stuff like this. And I wanted to be like, hang on, you're confusing. Like, <laughs> live music with kind of live music. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I worry that then bands who are playing fully live are going to be compared to the standard of a, a, yeah. standard of a band that have a 50% backing track, which who are obviously going to sound better. Like, you can't compete with a perfect playback or with 10 extra guitar layers making it sound really thick and immense. You cannot, as a live band, you cannot compete with that. And so it's like, I don't want people to confuse what's fake with what's good. You know, it's not the same as seeing four people have that synergy and create something that sounds amazing live.